Thor pretty much did all the organizing for this one. Um, if you're not familiar, we'll get into this in a second, I guess. Uh, before we get started, how many in the room are education folks? Is it you? Yeah, good crowd. And how many? Back in the room. And how many? Yeah, pretty, pretty good crossover. So, uh, we already started with a little bit of networking. Uh, we go through a few things here to get us started, and then I'll do some introductions, and we'll turn it over to Sean and Thor. So if you're not familiar, Mobile Portland is all about mobile. Um, we meet the fourth Monday of every month, mobileportland.com. <clears throat> and uh, we're modeled after something called Mobile Mondays, uh, but we went independent. So a few places you can find us. I thought I deleted that IRC thing. I guess I forgot. Yeah, every month that gets brought up, right? Exactly. So we have a few sponsors for tonight, and we usually give our sponsors a chance to say a word or two. So I'm going to hand off the microphone. So I'm Rob Mills. I'm with uh, Rubemar Community Credit Union. Um, some of what we're doing is we're just uh, taking web services and consuming them in uh, responsibly designed web pages, allowing our members to do what they want on their own terms wherever they want. Uh, something that doesn't have a whole lot to do with mobile um, is some work we're doing on Gresham Station. So if you're out in the Gresham area, take a look around for our signs. I'll have more to say next month, but we got some pretty cool stuff going on out there. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm with Soft Source Consulting, or the logo of Fog Left. Uh, we're a small boutique custom application development firm specializing in line of business applications and mobile development. We have about 25 consultants on staff, architects and developers. So we tend to be project-based um, uh, offices in Seattle and Portland, and so we, we tend to deploy teams to whip out an entire software project and then deliver it in a tidy bow. We're uh, not a staff on firm, but a, a consulting firm. So talk to me if you need any work done. Uh, I'm Ramsey, uh, also known as Door Guard or Door Troll. Um, I work at Urban Airship. Um, this is, we're on the third floor here, so we're providing the space. And, um, if you have any questions about what Urban Airship does, or why it's called Urban Airship, or anything like that, you come talk to me afterwards. I'll try and answer most of those questions. Um, but uh, I, I really enjoy working at Urban Airship, so I'm happy to answer any questions. And hi, my name is John Boone. I'm the founder of ProFocus. Uh, we're a technology staffing company, and one of the things we specialize in is mobile development. Um, right now, we've got um, positions open in Android development. We also have some cool um, clients that are doing uh, .NET and mid-level Java developer and web developer uh, positions. So, so, if any of those sound interesting to you, please talk to me after the meeting. Thank you. We usually uh, take a few minutes and give people an opportunity if you have any job openings or announcements or looking for something. If you want the microphone, please raise a hand and say. Hi, my name is Jeff Mooney and I'm a volunteer with the Oregon Bioscience Association. We came last year and invited Portland Mobile uh, to attend this year we're inviting Portland Mobile to attend again our conference in uh, September. It runs the 15th through the 17th. Day three is a day that's focused on biosensors. So the whole day is um, from, from morning to about noon. Is, um, we've got speakers um, that are focused on, on biosensors. The day is sponsored by Intel Healthcare and Biotronic. So if you're interested in attending the whole conference or just the third day, which can be um, uh, pay for a la carte, it's OregonBio.org, so hope to see you there. Hey, I'm Micah. I work for an educational company called Membi. Uh, we're teaching vocabulary. Uh, we're about to have a few job openings coming online. Uh, we're looking for a sales and marketing person, a Ruby on Rails developer, and a QA test support. Jack of all trades type. So let me know if you're interested in any of those or if you know anyone. Hi, I'm Neha. Um, just moved out here from New York and we moved our startup with us. And we it's called Where I Go and we're looking for iOS mobile app developers at the moment. Um, 
Um, so if anyone knows of any good ones, <laughs> we'd love to get the recommendations. Thanks. Welcome to Portland. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So we haven't consistently done this, but the few times we have, it's uh, worked out fairly well. So I'm going to give it another try tonight. Um, once we're actually done uh, with our event, I'll actually wander over and stand over by the whiteboard. Anybody wants to continue the conversation or continue networking, um, I will lead a small band of folks across the street, and we'll go grab a few beers over at Rogue and, and see where the networking and the conversation goes. Thank you. So, um, a few of you in the room know me and know my background, but most of you don't. I've spent 17 years developing software. About a decade ago, we wrote a software graphing calculator for Palm Pilots and made some amazing inroads into education. But what we found back then was that no one was actually ready for this technology. There was an awful lot of conversation, there was an awful lot of hand waving, but no one was quite ready. In my experience 10 years, 12 years ago, the teachers all felt very overwhelmed by these technology changes. Staff couldn't handle the deluge of devices. Administration had no clue where any of the money for this stuff was going to come from. In one decade, that's almost all changed. Uh, today's teachers are all ready. Um, in fact, most of them who weren't ready back then have retired, and we now have a whole group of teachers that were digital first people, grown and raised with Apple IIs in their hands. Uh, the systems are much better in the schools, and we're much more prepared to roll these out to our students. And, well, our school districts still don't have any money. But the devices have gotten a heck of a lot cheaper. So we actually have abilities to roll these out in parent organizations that are making this stuff happen. Even more so, in my experience, the, PT, the parents themselves are pushing really hard, which was something that we didn't see a decade ago to actually get this technology in the schools. When I was in middle school, they taught technology classes, and they took us in a room and had us type on an electric typewriter and called that a technology class. So I'm really excited that we're finally moving beyond those days. Uh, schools here in Oregon start next week. We're lucky to have two experts with us tonight in the field of technology and education. Thor Pritchard is the founder and CEO of Clarity Innovations, a nationally recognized consultancy that helps both companies trying to move into education and schools with their adoption decisions. And Sean Williams, a former elementary classroom teacher who now helps all teachers in Portland's Riverdale School District as the director of instructional technology. Join me in welcoming them both. Thank you. do a tag team approach where I'll just line y'all up and he's going to knock you down with some wow later. So I'm going to do the boring stuff. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> of uh, some demos of, uh, not demos, more data about Ed and mobile and all that. Okay, so the first uh, item, first homework assignment for tonight's back to school session is, uh, I tried this earlier and uh, apparently if I don't say free beer first, you won't get the directions. So you'll get a free beer if you can find uh, one of the local developers here in Portland who's made an education apps icon here. Uh, if you know it, just place your hand, come see me afterwards, so I'll give you a free ticket for a beer, which means come across the street for a beer. Uh, if you're a local app developer in education and you don't see your icon here, you're entitled to two beers. So I tried my best to find everybody who's here locally doing app development education, so hopefully they're all here. Now, not all these are done here in Portland, mind you, but, but these are all education apps to some degree or another. 
uh, used in education. So uh, first a bit of background about Clarity, because it's the, you know, the spiel, but also more of a disclaimer. We work with the companies there on the right. We do these kinds of things on the left. So uh, I don't think I'm saying anything biased or special and privileged information, so don't quote me on that, but I think uh, it's good to see you all know that. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is really about what I learned in my summer vacation, which is really not just this year, but the last several years. We've been looking at mobile and education since about, well, before the iPhone, really. We were looking at what was happening in Europe, what's happening in Japan. They had phones, they had televisions, they had phones that did tax returns, they, they did all sorts of weird things. Uh, and none of that was happening here until the iPhone really leapfrogged a lot of those innovations and allowed us to do, instead of a single purpose device with fixed uh, sets of features, a multi purpose device with limitless kinds of applications built onto it. So, uh, we've been really following this trend and really looking at where that, what does that look like in education? And obviously, there's a lot that can happen there. We'll get into that later on in these slides, and, and Sean will talk a little bit more about how it, what it looks like in Riverdale. But I figured I'd sort of lay the groundwork of just what does it mean for mobile and education? What does it really look like in terms of how are people using mobile devices? And then really talk about some of the education apps, the challenges of that, and, and really where things are headed. So first, let's talk about today's wireless family. I wish this graphic was a little bit better resolution, but since this projector is not the greatest resolution, it looks fine. Uh, this is from uh, CTIA, the, anyone remember that acronym? Uh, Communications, Telecommunications Industry Association. They now just go by the Wireless Association. Uh, and they did this graphic uh, last year, and already it's out of date because several of these numbers are actually a lot higher. So if you see anything that says 2012, you can plan on just doubling the number you see. If you see anything that says 2013, just add a half to whatever you see uh, because it's been a really rapid change in things. But this is some really interesting things about how today's wireless family, a zero to one year old, 10% of them have used a mobile device. We've seen those videos on YouTube, probably, uh, and obviously there's a lot of different ways uh, that they're using it. Uh, let's see, teens, obviously, 77. What's interesting is uh, several states, I want to say like 24 of them, have actually changed their laws. You know, up until recently, every state had their own textbook adoption rules, so that every seven years they pick a science textbook they're going to adopt. Next year it's a math textbook, et cetera, et cetera. Well, several states like Texas, North Carolina, uh, Illinois, or is it Indiana, I can't remember, have changed it to now say, those don't have to be physical books, and it doesn't have to be done every seven years. You could be spending that budget on whatever instructional resources in bits or atoms, it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, so that's a huge opportunity for technology, instructional technology, and, and we're seeing it in the market already. You've probably heard about a lot of educational related startups, uh, there's something like, I want to say, half a billion dollars invested in new startups in education just this year alone. Um, how many people can spell the word bubble? I can. Uh, it's coming. Uh, but with this, with all the sort of pressure of the opportunity of mobile and technology, there are a lot of things they're doing with it. Uh, and here's sort of the top five reasons. This actually came from the uh, Tomorrow's, or Project Tomorrow. It's a survey that's been going on since Net Day. Does anyone remember Net Day in 97 or so, I think it was? Uh, that was back when the internet was in modems. Uh, and what they did was basically they pulled schools, thousands of schools, thousands of teachers, students, etc., and asked them, what are you thinking about technology? How are you using it? It's been an annual survey, lots of longitudinal data, and a lot of my slides are going to draw on some of that data. But this has been found to be the top five reasons, according to those, that survey, uh, of why they're going into mobile. You know, provides a means of review materials online, allows them to sort of study at their own pace, from their own device, wherever they might be, anywhere, anytime learning. Uh, increasing student engagement, obviously the bright, shiny object nature of it, we're all moths, we're all drawn to the light, uh, really helps that. Um, personalizing the learning, instead of being, you know, everyone's at the same textbook, everyone can now have their own materials uh, and look and explore and learn about that follows their own curiosity. Uh, these are things that really are important to schools and where it's going. And one of the sort of side effects, it's less about student achievement, but just really the mechanics and logistics of schools. With a mobile device, it's a lot easier to get a hold of parents. It's a lot easier to do a permission slip, theoretically, in a digital format. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for just easing the pain of having kids in schools and the logistics of, of that. Within schools, uh, students have access to a lot of different kinds of uh, mobile devices. It's kind of funny that they actually still have e-reader listed. I would bet that data is really, you know, kind of overestimated nowadays. But you can see, these are the grade levels here on the left. K2, that's early elementary. Think of K2 as before they can read. 
And then 3-5 is late elementary. Now they can read to some degree. 6-8 uh, is middle school, 9-12 is high school. I kind of not really address higher ed because in a lot of ways the higher ed market when it comes to mobile use is much more like just the adult consumer market. Uh, there is obviously specialized apps in higher ed, uh, but they can fend for themselves. Maybe I'm just biased that way. Sorry, Peter. Uh, <laughs> that's just my take on it. So you can see here the gray bar is e-readers, tablets is the teal bar, laptops the purple bar, uh, gold is smartphones. And you see as you go up in grades, the penetration of these devices go up, uh, but impressively so for smartphones. Tablets, not as quick. Uh, in fact, they actually go down. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Mm -hmm. So how are they using it for learning? Um, again, there's a lot of different ways they're using devices. Most of these are talking about uh, tablets provided by the school uh, in different formats. We'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of them are using it for communication, which is pretty much no duh. A lot of them are using Instagram, no duh. Uh, but the other ones that are interesting are you know, using it for research. Uh, using it for accessing online textbooks, other uh, subscription materials. A lot of times schools aren't just buying textbooks, they're buying subscription services where they're paying a fee per student per year to access a whole rich curriculum. So uh, Discovery Video, not Discovery Television, but Discovery Education, which runs all a bunch of streaming videos on a wide variety of topics. Think of it as like almost Encyclopedia of Britannica, but all video from everywhere for all different sources, including these television programs. Uh, is a subscription service, so a lot of times they're accessing materials like that. Uh, games is obviously another part of it, and they are playing a lot of games in schools, and that's obviously a trend that we're going to see growing a lot. But one of the biggest uses, this data is actually a little bit behind, saying 40% take an online assessment, that's going to double, because it's really coming down to where we have a lot of the, the Common Core stuff that's been adopted in most of the states. There's also another initiative that's independent of that to do standardized assessments that are all going to be digital assessments. Now here in Oregon, schools have been doing digital assessments since the dawn of time, since like 2000 or 95 or something like that. Right after modem was invented, they invented online assessments. Uh, but in the rest of the country, they're freaking out. And uh, they're really trying to figure out how do we do this. And so there's been a lot of push to use mobile devices, tablets, iPads particularly, to do that. And uh, when we talk a little bit more about that, that, there's actually some wrinkles in that. But that is a, a big chunk of their time that they're using these devices for. Now, how are those devices made available to them? Here's where it gets kind of crazy. It's not uniform in any regard, and it varies by grade level as well. So this pie chart tries to sort of go through the five different ways you can have mobile devices in a school. So sometimes they might have one-to-one. One-to-one is shorthand for one device, one student, and it's theirs for that class. Now, what's funny is there's true one-to-one, -one, one person, one device for the rest of the school year, and there's shared one-to-one. -one. For a fourth period, you get a device. But when you end the end of fourth period, you leave, someone else is going to use that device in the fifth period. So it's kind of like pseudo one-to-one. -one. So there are some that are true one-to-one, -one, some that are sort of false one-to-one, -one, and there hasn't been a lot of differentiation in the, the data collection about that. But that is actually a really big headache, and we'll talk about that. Yeah? Oh yeah, that's, that's sort of the sixth category that when they did the data collection, they didn't really see being recognized yet. But that's actually growing, and I would say it's probably the size of the yellow sliver right now. Uh, it's going to grow more and get more and more complicated to different uh, kinds of devices, etc. Uh, so then you have the other type of devices where it's just they have a handful of collection. They got five from a grant. They have there to share in small groups, and it varies by grade level. You know, in, in elementary you're going to have learning stations where in that corner you're going to do math, that corner you're going to do sandbox science, over here you're going to do something else. So they might have an iPad in each corner of the room. Uh, in middle school it's going to be much more where you have a class set going around on a cart where they then come into the classroom with the cart, they pass them out, they do their activities for the period, and then they pass them back in and go on to the next class period. And then some just don't have anything yet. And this, I don't think, shows uh, that sort of as being a real case. That, that's right, this data is actually taken of those who actually have devices, uh, not the whole survey set originally. Now one of the things that's interesting to see is just how attitudes have been changing in just the last four years. Now four years sounds like a long time, and in mobile development, that's like an eon. But in schools, that's like glacial change, you know. This is really only the same as four months' time in mobile development world, okay. Schools move very slow. So four years or five years feels like a long time to school, or not a long time at all to schools, but to the rest of us, uh, it feels like a long time. But what's interesting is the changing attitude. So principals really saying students aren't allowed to use the devices within a district has dropped from 52%. Half the school principals in the country said, no way, Jose, to mobile device. Now it's only a third. And I think that's actually going to drop again. Again, this is 2013 data. It's going to drop again by at least half. Uh, the other one is 41% say they will allow devices 
uh, in their school year, school this year, um, and that's actually going to go up. And I think this is where we're going to see BYOD, bring your own device, really start to pick up. So schools, instead of having to supply all the devices, parents can buy their own devices for their kids or have their own iPhone or, or Chromebook or whatever it might be, and they can bring it, subscribe it to the network, and be able to pick up where they left off. Uh, we're going to see more and more of that. And here you see in 2010, only 3% allowed BYOD. Now in 2013, it's showing 10% had BYOD. So there's a really changing market happening, uh, and really the attitudes are shifting, and there's a lot of different ways of using devices, a lot of enthusiasm. And part of this, I think, has to do with the fact that the education market has been primed. You know, when Ilya was doing the, uh, not iPad, it was the Palm uh, software, you know, there was a whole movement in education back in the 2009, late 90s, about handhelds in education. This is before network devices, this is before color screens, but a lot of schools invested a lot in Palms. And then it all went away when Palm decided to become a cell phone uh, developer, and it just kind of crashed and burned. But now with iPads, it sort of was, that was the priming of it. So now the market is really ready to pick up where it left off. There was a lot of curriculum written. There was a lot of teacher development done back in those days. That now they're sort of refreshing that and realizing, oh, we can do this again. We've, done, we've been down this road before. So unlike other kinds of technology in education, the uptake of, of mobile devices in education has been faster than many other devices uh, or technologies we've seen ever. So, so that's sort of the demographics, and it's, it's still an evolving, changing picture. And obviously, we, if we're doing this again next year, all these numbers will be different. But let's talk about where the market data is in terms of devices. Uh, Apple doesn't really disclose much of this unless you're listening to their finance uh, calls. So this is what we can glean from what uh, Tim Cook has said himself. Seven million have been purchased by educational institutions, 90% uh, market share, according to uh, two different reports for saying that if you extrapolate the numbers and cross your T's and dot your I's, somehow it comes out to that. Um, but he actually pointed out uh, a quarter, uh, three quarters of a million devices sold in Texas alone, uh, and that they, for the first time ever, have crossed a billion dollars in sales in just their fiscal year 2013. Um, that's a lot of devices. Um, and it looks like they're expected to sell another two to three million more devices in 2014. Uh, so it's, it's a juggernaut. It's definitely got the bulk of the market. Uh, but things are sort of changing, and you may have saw when they were doing this uh, financial results that there was some surprise that, oh my gosh, iPads are slightly declining in sales globally, uh, and that, oh no, this might be the end. And it's really not the case, uh, but in education, there is somewhat of a slowdown, because this, this last year, they only did about two and a half, three million, and they're not expected to do a huge uh, growth above that for 2014. And that has a lot to do with the new kid in the classroom, Chromebooks. Now, Chromebooks, you probably, how many people have heard about, follow Chromebooks at all, or just sort of aware of it? Okay, how many people actually developed for Chromebooks? Okay, one. Great, good, woo, thank you, Seth. Um, so Chromebooks uh, is sort of like, no one knows about them, because in the global sort of sphere of things, or in any kind of measure of economic success, they've totally tanked. Uh, no one's buying them commercially, not consumers, not business. The only sort of market segment that's been buying them is education, and only in the United States. 85% of all Chromebook sales last year were to educational institutions. 85% of all sales globally were in North America at educational institutions. And uh, just in Q2 of 2014, just the one I just finished, a million Chromebooks were sold at schools. That's a huge number. Uh, compared to an iPad, which has normally been driving a lot of sales. And both Gartner and ABI Research pretty much said, you can expect the sales for Chromebooks to you know, grow by 56 to 79 percent. I would say they're probably a little light. I would go to, I'd go to 85 percent if you want to you know, buy you a beer if I'm wrong. Um, but it's really because it has a lot more to do with why uh, they're using devices and how they're using devices, which changes. They're sort of realizing this as they've gone from iPod Touches to iPads to now they're Chromebooks, because they've had laptops, right? Well, why would they switch from laptops to iPads to Chromebooks? Well, it has a lot to do with other things, and, and realizing at the higher end level, you can't do Adobe Photoshop on an iPad, and you can't really do it on a Chromebook, but maybe you do it on a laptop or these other newer devices we'll, I'll talk about here in a minute. So there's a lot of things that schools are realizing that they still need iPads, but they need other kinds of devices for other parts of their uh, constituents. So part of it is the reason for changing devices and really using other devices, making it instead of a homogeneous, a heterogeneous sort of solution, is those assessments are actually, it's, it's debatable if it's a requirement or a required option you offer your students, but they have to have a physical keyboard. 
So technically, if you're using an iPad, you got to have an external keyboard you can attach, Bluetooth, etc. Not just to rely on the virtual one uh, for their, those new state assessments that are coming out. Um, the other one is the lack of uh, professional productivity and creativity tools I mentioned. But I think the real reason is this second one right here. This headache cannot be underestimated. I know teachers will pay, you know, top dollar for teachers who have already paid top dollar for their own school supplies, for their own, you know, stuff in their classroom, etc., for solving these problems. So much time and effort, and Sean can tell you lots of horror stories of managing devices, sharing files, suing email. Because remember, if you've got a cart lab full of tablets and fourth period bell rings, they got to log out of, on an iPad, not one app, but the 13 apps they used in that class period. Because you log in as Joey, and now your class period's over, so when Susie comes in for fifth period, I gotta make sure I've logged out so Susie can log into all those apps again. Now repeat that for six class periods a day, 180 days a year, it gets really complicated, because then you all, you're getting assignments that came from Joey when they were really supposed to be from Susie, and it's a nightmare. So part of that is the advantages of Chrome and how it manages devices, how it sets up profiles. So literally you can just say log out and it logs you out of a Chromebook. Uh, and now you log in and you log in all your apps all at once. So there's some, some advantages to that. There's also Microsoft's push. It's somewhat of a stretch. You know, sort of the joke is they're always late to the party for every new technology. Um, but this one has some, some merit we're seeing, uh, some interest in this. Uh, I think it was just um, Baltimore Public Schools just did a big uh, investment in these two-to-one hybrid devices, which is basically they couldn't make a decision to go tablet or laptop, so they're buying something that does both um, with a detachable keyboard. There's a, this Surface 3 on top, and I think that's the Asus down below. Um, but they're all taken seriously, especially in the education vertical. I'm not sure how much this two-in-one hybrid stuff's going to take off in the consumer market, but uh, for the education market, there is, real, there is merit for this. And given how much the Chromebook's been succeeding, uh, I mean, it's got other advantages than these, but I think this might, might actually work out, especially for school districts that have a huge investment in Microsoft uh, infrastructure, enterprise management, etc. This is a way to preserve that, because that's one thing that Microsoft is not quite really you know, taken off on is they already had solved this enterprise management problem of logging the student out of all your, your profile and let them roam to the next computer. Man, wouldn't it be great if you had that device? So maybe that will happen. Um, so that's where the devices are right now. And again, call, call me in a year and it'll be different. Uh, but we'll, we'll wait a couple years before we see how this shakes out. Next, I want to talk about apps. Um, I'm not going to give any app recommendations. You can go to any education conference and you'll see at least 10 sessions that say, top five apps for math, top five apps for social studies. And they're true, they're great. There's lots of apps, but I'm not going to give any recommendations. Uh, except buy local, buy early, buy often. Because um, <laughs> I'm a protectionist, really, at heart. Uh, but this is, this is some real data that somebody collected uh, off the uh, um, Apple's uh, iTunes uh, app store for paid apps. What kinds of apps were there for which market? So, so this is, you know, with the apps targeted the pre-K, like preschoolers, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, higher ed, professionals or consumers. Across the entire app store of all the paid apps, how many were there in each of these categories for those kinds of audiences? And the, the year data basically saying they did the survey four years, 10, 11, 12, and 13, and what it looked like. And what the trend was is this green line. And they call this the app gap. I think it's totally, absolutely right. And it was nice to have real data quantifying what I really felt was the gut instinct of there's lots of stuff for pre-K. You know, when you're going on a road trip to Seattle, you got to occupy the kids' time and attention. And there's lots of stuff for pros, consumers, and everything else. Games falls in the consumer spot. But there isn't anything in the real key educational years, three, five, six, eight. And that's a real, real gap that teachers will pay, again, and school districts will pay top dollar for high quality apps if they exist. The problem is, of course, Building apps that work for those right levels, that are actually structurally sound, that make a difference to help improve student achievement, really hard to do and not easy to do for $4.99 in an app store or not 99 cents or less. But what they really want are apps that do these things. Now, I actually made an internal decision because I don't agree. Digital textbooks actually came up near the top of this list, but I'm not in favor of that, so I moved it to the bottom. Um, because I think there's these other tools that are much more powerful and effective at use for uh, making it part of an instructional practice than just giving a textbook. Because that's really just a, a book. It's like a pop-up book. What do you do? It's got bells, it's got whistles, it plays video. But I think there's a lot more that you can do that makes a huge impact in, in how students learn in the classroom with the first three categories. And these don't have to be, you know, Photoshop. They have to be just simple things. And they can be lots of different kinds of content. So, you, you know, there's lots of great apps out there. 
Uh, one place that will look at educational apps is graphite.org. I didn't put it anywhere in here, but graphite.org is done by Common Sense Media. You may recognize the name. They're the ones who do all the movie video reviews for kids, for parents. Actually, it's for the parents, for their kids. Uh, they've basically expanded their staff to a lot of educational reviews of apps now. And any other educator in the country or the world can actually add their own field notes about how they're using those apps in the classroom. Uh, great stuff. So that's where I'd actually go to search for apps. Don't go to the App Store. That's just a nightmare. Uh, just go to graphpy.org and look it up by content, by common core standard, by grade level, by instructional strategy even. It's awesome tool set for finding apps. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why they fail. Um, if you're doing any of these things, uh, or lacking these things, then that's probably the problem. Gamification obviously is a big deal. I debated, do we call it gamification? Do we call it gamifying? Do we call it game theories? Do we, you know, gamification is the word I hate the most, so I thought I'd put that up there. Um, there's a lot of lack of use examples. So one of the problems is you might have a great app, but teachers have no concept of how to approach it. It's like, great, maybe this makes sense, maybe it doesn't, but I don't, if I don't have a sense as a teacher how this is gonna work, or where does it incorporate into my other instructional plan, I ain't gonna use it. So I need to have some sense of <coughs> where does this fit in my instructional plan and my strategies, what kinds of kids does it work well with or not. Uh, so having materials like that is really helpful. Sometimes it's just a matter of lacking the lack of tracking progress. Um, being able to know it's the same student coming back and logging in and being able to pick up where they left off is really nice convenience. So you're not having to say, flip through the first 17 pages because we're midway through the school year now and we actually get to the part you're using. On the flip side of that is too much administrivia, uh, which is really how do I manage my class of students, how do I log them in, how do I set up those accounts. That's also a nightmare, and there's a lot of ways to get around that by being simple and more grassroots rather than, oh, I need to connect to my student information system, and I need to do a data import-export system. No, no, no. There's things like, you know, bump and boom, now those devices are associated, that's your class, now you can have them log in with a little icon, you can project, or QR code, have the kids hold up devices, that logs them in, boom, shazam. Lots of things like that. Uh, the last thing is also, especially if you want to get into the volume sales of schools, you really got to speak to the standards, you got to speak to the curriculum. You can't just say, oh, this is a great math app. You got to tell them what part of math curriculum is this aligned to, how does it be used by third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, what about kids with learning disabilities, uh, what about English language learners. Those are all things you need to be able to address in the education market. Uh, this list actually comes from uh, Balefire Labs out of, um, I think they're in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, another, their firm that actually does app reviews as well, but they do it as a subscription service because they're willing to say the nasty things about apps. Uh, I love Graphite to death, they're a client of ours as well, but uh, they don't say anything impolite, they just won't review the app. Uh, whereas Bellfire will happily review that app and tell you it's beep, you know, it's, they'll, and they'll go through it and tell you why. And what's really nice is it's not just some, you know, loud mouth, opinionated person, uh, about the app, it didn't look look good or whatever. They've actually looked at all the research about best practices in learning design, instructional design, you know, the whole brain-based learning, all the actual practices of educational theory for the last 50 years, and come up with a rubric to evaluate every app by it. Now, it works better for certain kinds of apps than others, but it's darn good. Uh, and one time, she was out here last October and did a presentation and showed examples of good and bad and ugly, and the ugly was really bad. It's amazing how many bad apps for education are out there. Uh, so definitely check out their site, bellfirelabs.com, I think it is. They go into much more detail. They even give the research citations to each of these concepts so you can actually understand what they're talking about here. Uh, and they also provide a service to help app developers understand why this matters. So, so that's the uh, thing about apps. My one last plea for all app developers, please God know, just don't ever develop flashcard apps. We have plenty on the market. <laughs> and don't try to make an app that does 800 things. Because no one wants an app that does 800 things. They want an app that does one thing really well, maybe two things really well. You can always make more apps, but you can't, you can't bombard a teacher with an 800 device multi-purpose tool like that and say, oh, this is perfect. It solves all your classroom needs. Nope, it solves none. So keep your apps simple and to the point uh, in, in what they're trying to achieve. Uh, this sort of talks about the different kinds of design concepts. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but really, you'll sort of see this as you're looking at apps. There are really kind of two schools of thought about how you build an app. Uh, one is it's open-ended instructional tool. This is sort of from this constructivism uh, school of thought and theory about learning, where it's more open-ended, the teachers can use it in all their kinds of instruction. It's not gated in one certain way. Whereas structured learning experiences, I always like to think of that as the, uh, sort of Ron Popeil, the set it and forget it guy. 
Yeah. So structured learning experiences are like the set and forget it sort of oven of learning. You know, this is an app that's going to teach you lesson four of algebra, start to finish. Teacher can just turn it on, set you in front of it, and go. And the teacher doesn't have to do anything but then collect the iPads into the period. They might work. They might have some, you know, instructional merit and value, and they actually do improve test scores. But they have a very specific way to be used and very specific way to be taught with that unless you have aligned your classes start and that app's ready to go, you're not going to be able to use it. So uh, there's pros and cons to both. It really depends. Finding a good mix is what really matters. I think I've spoke to this already. Um, this is Apple's best attempt at uh, helping solve the app discovery problem on the Apple's website on the education section now. It's the back to school special. So they've organized apps into all these categories. Great. Wonderful. It'd be nice if you could filter or sort by grade level, but you can't. So again, graphify.org is really where to go for that. With all that said, there's still some difficulty in school space. Uh, we'll talk about this a little more when Sean talks about what's it like in the trenches at, at Riverdale and uh, using devices. But this again is from another data, the uh, 2014 survey. This was just finished this spring uh, on uh, mobile technology in K-12 education. And these are mostly school administrators, CTOs, CTIOs, whatever, people who are in charge of the, the, the rules. So you can make an app, always include sample content, sample activities, but put a log in. Do a PO to the school and say, hey, when you subscribe for a year, for a dollar, whatever you want to call it, charge, I don't care. Uh, you know, here's the code, so on your apps, put in that code and it'll be imaged that way, so now they'll all work. And at the end of the year, it'll tell you, oh, it's time to renew. And never have to go through this nightmare. And that way you can also charge whatever you want, and not have to worry about, oh, the volume discount is going to be 50% of whatever I want the retail price to be. The heck with that. You can charge a dollar retail, but then charge them $7 of app uh, that way. You know, if you want. Wouldn't recommend that. So, so that's, in a nutshell, uh, the Rube Goldberg Volume Purchasing Program brought to you by Apple. Uh, I think that's everything I have to talk about tonight. I'm going to now turn it over to my illustrious colleague, Sean Williams. Thank you. Do whatever you want with them. Share them, edit them, <laughs> ignore them, whatever. Uh, later on down the line, I'm at Shawnee on Twitter. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, that'd be great. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Up front, I do a lot of work with Google. Google's been good to me, and I have a slight bias towards Google. So, just throwing that out there in the beginning. Full disclosure. Uh, I think maybe to start off is, I have a bunch of slides here, but I was deleting them as Thor was going through. <laughs> <laughs> So they're there for you to look through. There's only a couple really to talk about. But um, remember these days? <laughs> Some of you are too young, but a lot of us remember. Uh, and now this is what the web looks like now, right? Every 60 seconds there's a bajillion Google searches. And, uh, YouTube is actually not on here, but it's becoming the largest search engine on the internet. And this is what our kids are growing up with. Actually, those kids would probably be wondering what Skype's all about, but we recognize it. Uh, and so that's where this is uh, about using Chromebooks in education, because Chromebooks tie in with the Google Apps for Education uh, ecosystem so well. And that's where a huge chunk of the buy-in is coming. Oregon was the first state to sign a co contract with Google in 2012, where statewide the Department of Education signed on with Google that every school district in Oregon could get a Google Apps for Education domain and go through it. And basically all it means is that uh, the lawyers at the state will take care of headaches uh, for the school district if anything comes up down the line. But what it means for teachers and students is we're able to provide the Google suite of productivity tools to every student in the state for free. Um, and Chromebooks play in with that really well. Um, you, there were a bunch of hands that went up with Chromebooks. We're still, they're still working on uh, less than an eight-second zero to web. Hasn't gotten there yet, but it's getting closer and closer to uh, seven seconds. The Thor left off talking about the Rube Goldberg Apple management. That was just for purchasing. That's the easy part. Deploying those apps to your iPads is where it gets to be a real nightmare. And Apple just came out with this great new way to do it through uh, mobile device management, that's still a nightmare. With Chromebooks, I can deploy apps to any of the machines in my district, any specific machines, any group of machines, 
anywhere I am on the, as long as I'm online, I can do it all through the control panel, which makes it just really so much easier. And those links are, are those apps are tied to the user's login, so I can even push out specific apps to specific students if I really wanted to. And so that's a huge part of why Chromebooks are becoming bigger and bigger. The market share is also getting bigger because they're just easy, they're cheap. Um, we're buying another hundred uh, as soon as I, well, possibly tonight if I get home in time. And uh, just because they're 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 cheap, they're easy to manage. We can push them out, and they do everything we need students to do. Chromebooks are an eighty percent machine. I don't know if you're have you heard that before. They're an 80% machine, that was the original design from the CR48, that they'll do 80% of what any user needs to do, or 80% of what everybody needs to do, however you want to look at it. But that's where um, Chromebooks come in. When we order another 100 from my district, I'll add them into our domain, and we'll be ready to go and give them to students in, it'll probably take about two hours for me to do on my own. And there's, uh, that's what it looks like at night in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. I was talking too long. Uh, so yeah, there's web-based management for them, which makes it so much easier. I can be anywhere. Last year, I was on a road trip with some friends. I was in a motorhome in Indiana. I was able to log into the control panel from my phone and deploy apps, manage Chromebooks, do whatever I needed to do. So it's that ease of management. The security, I mean, Google has better security than what any school has. Don't let them tell you anything different. This is uh, one of the original rollouts, one of the first rollouts of Chromebooks down in Redmond, Oregon, where, yeah, we had the students take them out of the box, set them up, and go. That's how easy it is. So that's a big part of why Chromebooks are taking over education. Uh, the next is seven devices. How many people are familiar? Okay, you know about, nice, you're rocking it. So, um, Nexus 7s can be managed the same way. And uh, by the way, I'm not trying to disparage Apple. They're beautiful, iPads are beautiful. I have several at home. They're wonderful products. Um, but everybody knows about Apples and education. Not a lot of people know about the Nexus 7 and the market that's coming up for that. And I figured you guys might be interested in that. Um, we worked with the team last year for the Google Play and Education team to develop apps and push a marketplace specifically for um, Nexus devices in education. And uh, they're managed the same way they're inside the control panel. You can manage them and roll them in your domain. Makes it a whole lot easier than that nightmare Thor was talking about. When it comes to actually rolling them out, it's uh, it's NFC, so you enter one into um, like a program mode, and then you just touch it to the back of the others, and it's enrolled. <laughs> if you don't believe how simple it is, um, I'm gonna slip a, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, this is a third grader at my friend Jenny's school who helped her enroll 30 Nexus 7 devices in less than two minutes. <laughs> she has a video of, of him doing it. And that's where just she has the first one, and she just tap it to the back. You get a little beep that it's synced. Put it down. Grab the next one. Is there a custom interface for the students, or it runs Android? But what's nice about it is you can have multiple users on it versus an iPad, which is a single user device. So it's going to be tied to your login. So just like on a Chromebook, a student logs in with their account, and they have their everything. And like Thor was th talking about with an iPad, when you log out, you've got to log out of all of those things. With a Nexus device, you log out, it's ready for the next student, the next student logs in, and they get their environment. So what, what makes the Nexus 7 different from any other Android product? It's, this is the one that's supported in the Play Store, Google for Education. Yeah. And is it, is it a Chrome tablet or is it an Android tablet? It's an Android tablet. Okay. The rumors of Chrome tablets are many. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see one coming out very soon, but yeah. Uh, so I'm just kind of skipping ahead. 
this is some of the stuff that you you all would, I thought you all might be interested in because this is what makes it easy for schools to purchase apps through the Play Store. Um, you can do it with, you know, in the Play Store. School district authorizes a PO to the Play Store and can choose whoever to purchase through that, and it's tied to their account. So teachers can start pushing out apps individually if a school district chooses to. In the way it's set up right now in my district, teacher basically sends me a request to buy some apps. I go to purchasing, we buy the apps, we go through the volume purchase program, yada yada. I get the licenses, and then I have to push it out through an MDM solution to find those iPad. It's a nightmare. And like Thor was saying, if, if you want to get in on the game, it's do make it as easy as possible. In the, uh, when was it? The, actually, there was a soft launch around February of, last, of this year. Uh, I think the full launch came out in April or May. The Google Play for Education Store. So if you're familiar with the Play Store, there's an actual store for education where they bring in the educational apps that are actually reviewed by educators and uh, rank them that way. I should point out at this point that Graphite is awesome. I am although also, I am the only Common Sense Media certified trainer in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> so Graphite's awesome, but this is here also. Um, and it has well, the free apps, it has um, paid apps. If your teachers are authorized, they can buy, purchase those apps through the Play Store, through your open PO, and push it out to students as an administrator of our uh, Google Apps for Education domain. Teacher emails me and says, I want this for these students. I can purchase apps and push them out just to those students. When you buy those licenses, um, if a student leaves in the middle of the year, the license stays with the district, so you just take it away from that ID and push it out to the next student's ID who comes in. Uh, there's a lot of filtering that you don't have in other app stores. So you can, uh, teachers can go easily go in and see, filter for what they're looking for based on common core standards, uh, grade level, uh, content area. The ones with yellow flags have been actually curated. Um, they have real teachers go through and, like I said, look at them. Um, what's nice is being on the review team for that is, as a developer, if your app doesn't get the yellow flag, there's a whole form for the reviewer to fill out and say, why not? And it gets sent back to the developer to say, we really liked it. You could be, you know, this is what it was missing or this is what we didn't like about it. As a developer, if you make some tweaks and send it back to Google, they send it, they push it back to the reviewers again, and they'll send it to a different reviewer than the first one. Um, yeah, that's you can read faster than I can tell you about that. So, um, and then it just when, <clears throat> excuse me, when an app is purchased, it's just like purchasing something through Green Play. Um, this is a, a newish thing, is we, you can push out books and uh, YouTube and U videos, that's all through the control panel. Probably not super interested in that. Um, you all can look at that later if you're interested. But this is what it looks like buying through a purchase order. It's super simple, it makes life just, yeah, easy is good. Um, just logging in, simple login. Students can do all this. Uh, the accessibility <laughs> features aren't as um, def as not defined, but as uh, smooth as Apple's um, accessibility features. To be honest, but there are a lot there. Getting ready for tonight, I put out uh, an email to uh, some statewide bot leaders. And this was what they came back with as a wish list when I said I was going to be talking to developers tonight. Um, these, are, these are the ideas that came from the top seven school districts in Oregon, just to give you an idea. Um, we want to see apps that will um, exercise higher level thinking skills. 
So, like Thor said, please, no more flashcards. There's, it's, we don't want to continue to foster a broken system was one of the comments that came with it. Um, we want kids to do things that will in, involve critical thinking, problem solving, authentic problem solving. So if you can create something that actually has the students going out into the world and applying and engaging with something real, um, it would be great to have integration with Google Apps or directory or Active Directory, whatever, some way so that teachers and schools can document what's happening. Um, what's happening now a lot is we're getting pushback from communities where we buy iPads and teachers see kids just playing flashcard games on them. Or not teachers, but parents see kids just playing flashcards games on them. They're like, why did I pay for that bond measure for a $700 flashcard. Uh, so it would be great to have anything that ties in with either of those so that we can document what students are doing and the progress they're making. Um, content tagging would be so nice because we're working with our students to get them to start curating their own resources and owning their own learning. So if there's some sort of system so they can tag their resources and, and take that with them. Uh, Cross-device usability is huge. Uh, we're in the process, and many schools are in this process, where whether it's BYOD, where the students are bringing in God knows what. Uh, but also with you know, the ideal classroom that many people are shooting for now, doesn't have 30 iPads, or 30 Chromebooks, or 30 MacBooks. It's got you know, probably 10 tablet devices, probably like 20 Chromebooks for everyday use, and maybe a couple of higher end machines that run special programs. And those are available to all the students to support a BYOD program. So don't make us choose between iOS and Android. If it's available everywhere, especially if it's developed for the web so that our student, you know, we're out of you know, whatever tablet it is today, you can still access it and get and use it on the web. That's even better. Um, the next one I'm not going to read all of, but immersive games. kids are into, uh, and we can get something out of. The data collection and analysis tools, even if it's just dumping that in, the data into like a CSV that we could do something with as a teacher, you know, to see where the student's progress is, where they're going, how often they're trying, what they're getting hung up on, any of that data. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy, but it's got to be easy to access, and we've got to be able to get to it. Um, Integration with LMSs, now that's just, that's a pipe dream. But, <laughs> but it would be awesome, it's worth putting on there. Um, but there's a lot of things like outdoor ed uh, type tools. We've got a fantastic PE teacher here that I'm sure would love to see more uh, tools that can be used outdoors uh, for data collection, for whatever, where students are active. I mean, they've gotten mobile devices. Um, at Riverdale, we just went fence-to-fence -fence -fence wireless on both of the campuses, so um, I want to get the kids out there doing things. Um, so we need some apps to help, to, to help them. And a single sign-on option would be kind of nice. That kind of goes back to that tie-in with uh, either Google Apps for Education or an Active Directory type thing so that students can track their data, log in, and get access to everything. Um, I think. Yeah? Sweet. <laughs> Seven fourteen. Mm. Way to go, Laura. We make fifteen. <laughs> and you can't pick up our voices very well without it. So um, I'm actually going to kick this off because I've got a, a question from a far away, from a long time, from a long time listener of the show. Um, a couple of years ago we had uh, another education session that Thor had organized and we had another teacher in and he spent some time talking about iPads at that time and how uh, positively impact what positive impact they were on 
on uh, achievement, and there's been very little discussion of achievement here tonight. Uh, Chromebooks might be cheap, but it's no use rolling them out if our students don't learn better. What say you? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, but Joe, Joe Morlock is the guy you're talking about. He was the director of technology at Canby Schools. He was using, actually, iPod Touches back in the day, like from the beginning, and only like begrudgingly moved to iPads when they came out. I kind of guess we'll start all over again. Uh, but this year, he actually left Canby School District to now be assistant superintendent director of tech for Lake Oswego. So he's doing pretty good. I mean, it must have worked because Lake Oswego hired him. But I don't have any actual good data since that presentation back in 2010, believe it or not. Uh, I'm sure he's got new updated slides and one of his other people at Canby probably could find out. But uh, I don't know, have you heard of anybody else looking at that kind of? Everyone's looking for data. Sorry. Everyone's looking for data to prove it, but it's kind of hard to find dual classrooms and set up that uh, case where this classroom is going to use technology and this classroom isn't, so you have a, a, a valid data set to go from. Uh, are, we, are we seeing differences from not having technologies in our schools to having, or is it, is it have to do with the technology or just having technology, if you know what I mean? Well, it has to do more with teachers knowing what to do with the technology than anything. You can give everyone in your classroom an iPad, but if the teacher doesn't know how to maximize that and, and how to leverage that tool, you're not gonna see the same results in achievement as you would if I spent a couple hours with Thor walking him through, helping him and supporting him with professional development, and gave him two iPads and he'd figure out how to use it with his class and improve achievement. So, question. There's also, just to add on what you got the questions out there, uh, Dell actually started the research about sort of this headache problem of trying to quantify if you got a Google Chrome book device, how much time saving are you getting from having to have kids log out of 13 apps and log into 13 apps if they're sharing a cart of iPads versus using a Chromebook where you can just log out, log in, kind of thing. Uh, and I don't know if they've got hard data yet, but I, I saw a data sheet that was talking about, oh, this saved me 42%. And I kind of rolled my eyes thinking, well, 42% of what? for who, you know, et cetera. But some people are starting to look at how you quantify at least the administrivia, the pain cost of this stuff. Um, great presentation, thank you. Um, two questions. The first one is probably more toward in, um, Google than in uh, um, offline mode. Uh, I keep hearing it's getting better and better, but I, I think at least I use Google Cloud a lot and still have the problem. Um, the second question is more toward both. Is, um, search. When I work with kids, I ask them to do some search. They say, great, look at YouTube. Hey, look, look at that great game. It's click. <laughs> Lost them. Yeah. So, uh, so the first thing is there's more and more tools that are going offline the, uh, for offline usability. Uh, most of the Google Drive products are available offline if you enable that. So you have to go into the, the little gear thing in the upper right hand corner and en enable offline drive. Uh, for docs, sheets, slides uh, and it works pretty well uh, the problem with it is the the best part of Google Docs I think is the collaborative nature of it so if you're working on, on a shared doc with two other people and they're online and you're over here offline and then they make changes and then when you sync up you can get some really funky results let's just <laughs> say that um, but it is there and that's one of the things that uh, historically has held back districts from purchasing Chromebooks because everyone thinks they're just you know, a doorstop if they don't have an internet connection. But uh, with the productivity apps that are going on offline, more apps that are actually running offline that you can get through uh, the Chrome Web Store, it's becoming less and less of an issue. And what was the other one? Search. Oh, yeah. So on search, the, uh, I was just double checking, uh, that's not it, but uh, is it Gaggle? No, dude, give me that back. <laughs> stop. Just stop. There's a puffin browser. Uh, sorry. With the search, you're totally right, but that's a classroom management issue. If your kids are going off task and doing something, just like if you said, open your math book to chapter, you know, six, page 122 or whatever, and some kid doesn't get out or gets out their math book, but then also gets out their notebook and starts doodling. That's the exact same issue. There's just not a screen involved. 
one of the things that we're working on more and more with teachers as I, I work with teachers throughout the state is working on search with students and teaching students how to be cognizant of search and what they're searching for, and then a good search starts before you even touch the keyboard and that kind of stuff. And when students are getting productive searches, my experience is they're more likely to stay on task because when you do a search for, you know, whatever, you know, Google's going to serve up 11 million results, and kids have to filter through that. So uh, the other thing is if you're an educator and you're interested in, in tanging that a little bit, if you can build a custom search engine which pulls the sites that you want to use, and then you kind of create this sandbox where the kids can explore and learn the search experience, but you've already decided that you're only going to pull resources from these 10 websites, so they're going to be presented with maybe 100 results instead of a million, and start working through it from there so they become more savvy searchers. <coughs> question, question on... Sean, you mentioned content tagging for your students. Is that just embedding meta tags that can be searched? Um, so can you give an example of content tagging? And the, the second question, you mentioned kids getting it done outside. Is there any thought to wearables and where that might be going to getting them outside and engaged more than just taking an iPad out and out in the real world? Um, so they have meta tagging, which would be awesome. Is that just of their just content? Uh, their content, or if there is some way, if you're if they're if you're producing a content creation app, if there's some way that they can tag it as theirs or assign multiple tags to it, so that as they're building their profile, their portfolio, they can have all of these products that they've made and have them tagged and searchable. Does that? Yeah. Um, I'm, and we prefer the term glass explorer to anything else you might have heard. Just <laughs> saying, <laughs> let's all be nice here. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of thought about wearables. Um, and the Android watch is, is definitely a step in the right direction. But for right here and right now, I mean just, yeah. Uh, realistically, developing an app so that when my students go out, there's a way for them to record soil samples or the intensity of the sun at different times of the day so they can start charting that out over the course of the day. Uh, if you look at the science standards, there's all kinds of things where, if you look through a science book, there's all these great pictures of the outdoors. They're, like, how crazy would it be to actually send the kids outdoors and see what grass looks like <laughs> and, and measure these things? That's kind of what... I have uh, really two questions, but they're sort of both the same in terms of what's the trend. Uh, and the first one is uh, structured versus open-ended, mm -hmm. one of the things we've talked about before. Um, <laughs> my, my impression is that the open-ended stuff is where the interesting things are happening, and structured is pretty much the same as it was 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but that might be because my data points are limited. Um, uh, you're totally spot on. And, and the other is uh, URL versus app. Uh, or you know, web web application versus something that's an installable app. Is there a trend going on there? That's a good question. On this, the second question, I don't know. Have you, I haven't really seen. Uh, I mean, there's educators have gone through the web 2.0 phenomenon. There's a lot of web 2.0 free services schools use already, but, and I think some of them are sort of using it hand in hand with their apps. I, I don't see it as one winning out of the other. Um, have you? I haven't heard. Not really, but kind of. But kind of tying into that is the idea that uh, so Edmodo is a popular app, and we can get to that on a Chromebook by by a URL, app in the Google Chrome Store, or an app on our tablet device. <coughs> so being able to access it from multiple points. Yeah. And then as for the other question, it's interesting between structure and open ended. Structure, it's a lot easier to evaluate. So most of the apps you see in Google, or excuse me, in, in Graphite, or you see on like the Bellfire Labs are structured learning. The open-ended ones don't fare as well because every teacher could use that app differently. And the, the app itself doesn't provide the direct instruction. It's just there for the teacher to use. So it's kind of like grading a, you know, a chalkboard. It's like, well, it's not the chalkboard that matters, it's the teacher using the chalkboard. One of the interesting, <coughs> one of the interesting uh, idea that I came across recently was 
some teachers in California, some, I, I wish I could call the schools, they get the name of the schools too. The teachers uh, in the classroom, they were telling students, so you go and attend some class, like, so I think the example they used was Khan Academy. So you go learn this lecture at home, that's your assignment. And then when you come, home, come to class, they don't give them lectures or teach them. It's just mostly group discussion and Q&A. So they're kind of changing the role of the teacher and how students have learned. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you're describing what they call the flipped classroom model. Which, and, and, and there are mixed feelings about Khan Academy, uh, about how well it is for an instructional tool, but, but that's the basic premise, is if you've got a good quality instructional material, like in a lecture format or a video or a reading assignment, you do that at home, and then the instructional time, instead of it learning the concepts, you're actually applying the concepts. So you're either working with students or your teacher is assisting you in groups on those things. Instead of being stuck at home with parents who don't understand the math, trying to figure out the problem, right? It's trying to flip that. And there are places where that works, and there are places where that doesn't work. And it's, it's really early. And so you see some good ideas, some not so good ideas, but uh, it's iterative. We're seeing a lot of improvement. And this is, you know, this is probably the first, second school year of flipped classrooms, right? I mean, I, this is, it's pretty recent. And so we really have to see this back to school time. Because to try to implement a flipped classroom is a huge endeavor, organizationally, planning, etc. So next week, we'll know to see how many more teachers have taken this on to try to do. But, uh, it could be interesting. Um, one of the other things, I'm, I was a teacher and I'm going kind of into app development now, um, but as a teacher I implemented a pilot program for a one-to-one -one iPad um, program last year. And one of the things that I noticed, and this isn't really a question, but that was really helpful for me as a teacher, were those open-ended apps that allowed students to actually create something and then save it to the camera roll and then re-access it in another app and do something. So having that ability, or even just to save it into like Dropbox or some place where that they can keep all of what they've created, was one of the things that made an app invaluable to me as a teacher. So just for those of you who are developing things, just to keep that in mind as well. Absolutely, great idea. We'll do one more. Thank you. Uh, my question is more about so if you're app developer, or software developer, and ISV, a curriculum publisher, how do you get your how do you get your content to be known? You know, you mentioned Graphite already, you mentioned you know some of the stores, and hopefully you're gonna get a lot of good reviews. Um, but but truly, I mean, how do you get it get it out there? And um, you know, I work on the hardware part of the business, and and there's always a challenge that our resellers think more. Hardware and now the software content, and yet it's a very difficult part to marry them and also to, I mean, to promote what it really matters the, the content part. Right? right. Yeah, selling an app is no different than selling any other piece of software or any other product or service. It will take a lot of marketing dollars, a lot of outreach, a lot of socializing, a lot of, or social media, I guess, what they call it, not socializing, but social media, uh, and really getting involved in the, in the market in terms of. Uh, regional and national conferences, presenting, finding other uh, teachers to be your evangelists. Those are the people that are going to be your best friends and getting word out there by word of mouth. But yeah, the store is not, I think of the store is just UPS. They're the delivery guys. They don't do anything else but get the app onto the devices. There's no hope of actually, you know, that one in a million chance Apple's going to say, oh, this is going to be a favorite this week. And sure, you get lots of hits, but then it'll go right back down once they stop the future. So, can't rely on them for that. That, by the way, is a question 1.4 million developers ask themselves every day. <laughs> <laughs> Including this one, right here. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, if you'd like to hang around, we'll probably go out for drinks. We'll meet over here by the whiteboards. I'm sure we can okay. get Thor and Sean to hang around a little bit. Thank you both for coming out and a wonderful presentation. Thank you.